We're going to be talking about chapter 18 in our textbook, um, Surgical as Sepsis. And uh, here's some learning objectives that the textbooks identified, and I think that they're good ones. I, I, I don't think I messed with these at all. Um, but we want to talk about medical as sepsis, which is previously defined in chapter 9. We'll talk about what the definition of medical as sepsis is. And we'll be revisiting this. So I've kind of jumped forward, um, and then we'll jump back uh, to talk about um, preventing disease transmission. But we'll, we will talk about disinfection and sterilization. Um, we'll talk about the types of sterilization that we use in hospitals. We'll look at um, some pictures of what sterility indicators look like on, on packages. Uh, we'll talk about establishing a, a, a sterile field, and you'll get an opportunity here in a little bit to kind of practice that a little bit, um, and ways to add objects to the sterile field. So we'll kind of make a fake sterile field here in the classroom and practice the magic tricks involved with adding stuff to the sterile field without it becoming infected, right? Uh, but the reality is, is I'm not going to be doing, you'll notice uh, there's no um, assessment related to this. The assessment is something you're going to need to do out in the clinic. So I'm going to give you the basics of it, um, but there are so many different ways of producing sterile fields and adding different objects to them, et cetera, et cetera. It's just going to be a more rich experience and more rewarding if you accomplish that out in the clinic. So I'll give you the basics. I'll explain everything to you. I'll show you um, the material that you need to understand. And then this is a competency that you're going to complete out in the clinic. Um, so that's true for um, skin preparation, uh, sterile gloving, um, surgical hand scrubs and hand rub, that's different from hand washing, uh, sterile gowning, um, and then uh, assisting or removing a, a dressing and, and, and applying a sterile dressing. So here's the key terms uh, that we'll be talking about. Um, and you'll notice there's other kind of key concepts in this chapter, but these are the ones that require like kind of specific definitions. Um, so these are the ones that I've selected and the textbooks selected as well. So let's talk about sterilization first. Um, sterilization is the complete destruction of all organisms and spores from equipment used for patient care procedures. That's coming from the textbook chapter uh, 330, or page 331, just the definition of sterilization. So it's helpful to think about these other, these other concepts as well. Medical asepsis is kind of the environment that we swim in in a hospital. And these are the various methods that we have of reducing pathogenic organisms in the environment and intervening in the process by which those microorganisms are spread. So pretty much everything in a hospital is designed to do that, from the way that doors are designed to the way that the airflow through the building works, um, to the lighting in certain areas, to the temperature even in certain areas, um, is designed to reduce pathogenic organisms, microorganisms in the environment um, and so I, one thing I want to point out to you is that your body really is a universe, right? Um, it has various environments inside of it. Um, like they talk about in, uh, in yoga and stuff, health is in the gut, right? Well, what's really in the gut is a whole lot of microbacteria, right? In fact, there's more single-celled organisms I have heard living in your intestines than there are cells in your body, right? Now, every single, uh, uh, every single one of those microorganisms that's living in your intestines, you received it at a really, really early age, right? You received it like with your, from your mother, from your father, in the environments that you were at in your home, right? And so they are unique to you. They've evolved over the course of your life, and they have their own little shapes and forms and things. They live in a, an environment that's unique to you. They love you, right, and everything about you, right? Um, but if they were to enter into my body, they would make me sick, right? So they're unique to you. 
So each one of you really is just this little walking around disease bag is what I'm saying, right? And we understand that in hospitals, that every single person you come into touch with is just this kind of gigantic floating bag of infection, right? Um, walking around on bones, I guess. But that's why physicians and some people are not really happy about shaking people's hands, right? Um, or, you know, uh, you know, the side hug thing or whatever, the, the, you know, uh, um, what do they call it? A, like caring touch or whatever. They're not really into that whole thing because they have fully subscribed to the walking disease bag philosophy. Um, I'm almost in that camp, but not quite. I've seen extreme examples of it, but it is worthwhile knowing. Now, <clears throat> the reason I point that out is because those microorganisms, the, those microflora that are existing inside your gut, right, um, they actually are really critically tied to your health. They have jobs. They live in a, a symbiotic relationship with you. Um, so medical asepsis is designed to reduce the disease, those microorganisms from moving from one person to another. It is not designed to completely eradicate them. And that's important, right? Because if you start completely eradicating these things, you can actually cause more problems, right? So it's something I want to stress that we are trying to figure out ways to maintain the little universe of each person that walks around inside the hospital while making sure that those universes don't pass organisms between each other because that would be a problem. But when we talk about surgical asepsis and sterilization, we are talking about destroy with extreme prejudice. Destroy it all, kill it all, and let God sort them out. Like, I don't care if it was a beneficial bacteria or not, we're gonna kill all of it. Um, so sterilization is the complete destruction of all organisms and spores from equipment used to perform patient care. And so the process of creating and maintaining a sterile field is what we're talking about when we talk about surgical asepsis. So I just want to point it out, those terms are radically different. I know they both have the word asepsis in them, but they are radically different. Um, one of them is kind of the environment that we walk around in the hospital, an environment of medical asepsis, hand washing, things that prevent the, the spread of disease, right? They, they, we're not preventing the disease, but we're preventing its spread. And surgical asepsis is we're creating sterile environments where everything has been destroyed. Um, now here's the creepy thing about sterile environments where everything has been destroyed. They're beautiful, right? It's like you, you get this sense of like, how God must feel when he wipes out an entire planet or something. It's like, boy, this is, this is beautiful. All that craziness is just gone, right? Like God after the flood. Boy, it got really quiet down there. Um, so truly sterile environments are wonderful. Like if you've ever had sinus, you know, sinus problems or anything like that, to really go into a sterile environment is, is kind of redeeming. There, well, how do we achieve it, right? How do we achieve sterilization? Um, well, there's a bunch of different things that we can do. We can just take stuff that kills things and soak the other things in the stuff that kills things, right? And everything that's on that thing will die. That's chemical sterilization. We take chemicals that are really, really toxic um, and we soak the things in it and then it, it kills everything on the surface. These, uh, so an example of chemical sterilization that we use all the time is what I've called baby killer wipes, the cavicide wipes right? Those are a form of cure, a chemical sterilization or it's a chemical cleaning product. I would treat it as a chemical sterilizer and wear some freaking gloves anytime you're handling those things. If it's an alcohol wipe, don't worry. You don't have to worry so much about gloves, although I, I still would recommend gloves. But the cavicide wipes, that's serious chemical sterilization equipment that they've put on a wipe. That's why it says no babies. Um, so Though this is one of the less satisfactory methods for sterilization, it's kind of old school, and it involves more time, preparation, um, and it can be difficult to completely sterilize an object by chemical sterilization. So we autoclave, right? And this is probably the most old school form of, chemo of, of sterilization. Just get the thing really hot, right? So they it involves heat and steam under pressure. Um, it's like a, basically a, a giant pressure cooker. 
Um, and this is one of the most common methods used for sterilization. The problem with, the only problem thing with, with uh, autoclaving, because uh, extreme heat, pressure, and temperature destroys all sorts of life forms and viruses, right? It destroys everything. Um, but we can only do that to like metal stuff, right? And not everything we use in a hospital is metal. So this would be completely useless, for example, for cleaning off um, plastic pieces like this, uh, this tubing over here that I've got on the podium, right? Um, it would melt the plastic, it would render it useless. Um, but it is very convenient. Um, in general, what we're talking about is the object has to be able to withstand um, high temperatures, and that's 250 to 275 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's here in the textbook right here. So, um, but very often this is used for surgical instruments and trays because those are made out of metal. Conventional gas sterilization. This uses both poisonous gases and heat, right? Um, this is good for stuff that can't be autoclaved. If it can't withstand the heat of the autoclave, um, so stuff that's electrical, plastic, rubber items, optical stuff, um, even telephones, stethoscopes, blood pressure cuffs, can be gas sterilized. What's the problem with gas sterilization? It is a poisonous gas. It kills people too, right? Um, so we have to leave time, additional time to vent the gas out of the building. And we have to vent it very slowly because there's all sorts of government laws about how quickly you can vent this gas out of the building, right? They've said, okay, X amount of this poisonous gas is okay in the atmosphere or wherever, um, but you gotta vent it kind of slowly. You gotta let it out there slowly, right? So there again, very effective, but the gases are poisonous and uh, the process can be time consuming. Gas plasma technology, I don't really know where this gets its name from, what the plasma exactly is, um, but this is uh, safer than uh, the, the poisonous gas stuff It's uh, and because uh, there's no toxic byproducts with this one. Um, and so we can use this to sterilize the same kind of objects that we could sterilize the conventional gas, right? Um, and it's a little bit more cost effective, a little less time consuming. Uh, but there's certain things we can't do with this. We can't use it on linens. Um, we can't use it on little tiny things. That's what that means, narrow lumen. Like, so there's small bore scopes and things that they use for, uh, like, ure urethral stents and things like that, or, or urethral stents, they can't, they can't do gas plasma with it. And then just dry heat. Um, so this can be used uh, in places that are a little bit more, uh, already more humid, right? Um, and we have a vacuum chamber, so the air is gonna kill, loss, loss of air will kill some things and whatever doesn't, isn't killed by that, we apply really, really high heat to it. So you'll notice this is much higher than the heat in the autoclave. This is close to like the burning point for some things, right? Um, so uh, this is less expensive than autoclave, but again, can the object take the high, high heat? Um, and this one may not, uh, I'm, not I'm, I'm looking in the textbook, it may not actually be in the textbook, um, but just know it's just an extension of autoclaving, just a kind of a subset of it. Um, so it has some advantages though over the autoclaves and the gas. Um, it is just, ha the heat just has to penetrate the object, not a gas or something like that. Um, the disadvantage is it requires uh, a long time again. So anytime we're dealing with sterilization, prepar preparing for a surgery or something like that, know that this is the major time constraint, right? This is the reason why um, ORs basically go to sleep at night, right? It's because we're sterilizing everything for first thing in the morning.
right? Um, uh, <clears throat> All right, so if you look on uh, page 332, you'll see an example of a sterility indicator. The tape that they've wrapped this package in, um, it was originally, it was like just plain. It didn't have the stripes on it. Once it had been subjected to the conditions of sterilization, it got those little candy stripes on it, right? So it lets me know, okay, this is a sterile package and then it has a, a, a label on it to tell me when it was sterilized so I can know how long that sterilization will last. So that's just one example of a sterility indicator, but it's one of the most common ones that we use. So uh, there is a, an entire pretty much department at the core of the operating room um, and at the core of the hospital who is charged with packaging things for sterilization and sterilizing the various objects in the various ways. So um, it's important to know this conceptually and to know this practically. And the big, the big takeaway here is number one, sterilization is complicated, right? Um, it involves separate, separately trained technologists to handle sterilization. So in general, you will not be asked to sterilize anything. I mean, not in my 15 years of working in hospitals, I was never asked to sterilize anything, right? Um, but I think it's, the reason I'm telling you about these different processes is because understanding them gives me that much more of respect for how complicated a sterile field is, right? And makes me that much more aware of ways to maintain sterilization, knowing how difficult it, it was to produce on the, on the front end. So that sterile field we can define as a microorganism-free area prepared for the use of sterile supplies and equipment. So how do we make a sterile field? And if you want to, you can follow along this on uh, page uh, 334. It's got all the pictures and stuff of, of, how, to, of how to do this, right? We're going to clean the surface first off, and we're going to clean our hands, right? Um, then we'll inspect the package. So a lot of times there's instructions on the package that are super helpful and worth checking out. Um, but we will make sure that the package is, is intact, that no part of the package has been damaged, anything like that. Just like if we were buying yogurt at the grocery store, right? Um, then we'll unfold uh, the first corner away from you. And you'll notice this is the only time that this individual will reach over the area of the sterile field. She's unfolding the package away from her. So I've just reached over the area that I'm saying is sterile, right? Why was that okay? Well, because these backs here are considered non-sterile, right? Um, so since the other folds haven't been opened yet, it's okay to reach over that is the rationale. Now um, we're gonna unfold the sides and then the, the, the trickiest part is the last. Once we've got those sides open, right? If you can imagine this is the last fold, I'm gonna grab the last fold on what will be the bottom of it, right? And I'll just drop it, right? And it's gonna drop wonky like this, which is a pain in the butt, because now I've got this sterile field that's looking like this, so this is all sterile now, right? But I can't freaking fix it. You have to poke on the bottom of it or something. So you'll watch people as they're preparing sterile fields, watch those little poking on the bottom of paper techniques that they're using um, to make the thing freaking behave, right? Because what we're talking about is making a, st a sterile field that's basically just made out of paper, right? We're doing some crazy origami that makes it uh, sterile. You now have a sterile field. If you follow those four steps, you've, you basically have a sterile field. And the, the big thing here is do not touch the inner surface. The moment that you touch the inner surface, you no longer have a sterile field. You now have a contaminated field, right? Don't even look at it wrong. Like something my dad would say. Um, so surgical asepsis, 
principles of this. And there's lots of principles with this. And this is, uh, I, I believe, also listed in the textbook. Yeah, box 18-1 on page 337. Any sterile object or field touched by an unsterile object or person becomes contaminated. Never reach across a sterile field. Um, if you suspect an item has been contaminated, discard it. Do not pass between the physician and the sterile field. Right? So those are kind of the golden rules of sterility. Um, in maintaining a sterile field, I'll, I want to, I start this concept here because there's a critical thinking skill here and there's also an ethical consideration. It talks about the sterile conscience. And I'll go ahead and read this out. We cannot overemphasize the importance of developing a sterile conscience, which refers to an awareness of sterile technique and the responsibility for telling the person in charge whenever you contaminate a field or observe its contamination by someone else, right? Um, I say this to the wallflowers out there, right? When it comes to maintaining a sterile field, we are all in it together. You can tell the chief operating surgeon that he just contaminated a sterile field. And please do. He will thank you, or she will, if they are worth their weight, right? Because we are all charged with understanding this sterile conscience, right? And when I think about the word conscience, I think about both an awareness and an ethical responsibility, right? Like Jiminy Cricket, right? Let your conscience be your guide. Um, from Pinocchio. Y'all have seen Pinocchio, right? Okay. okay. It's a classic. All right, so let your conscience be your guide, right? It's going to both motivate you and um, make you aware of things, right? And that's what we're talking about with this sterile conscience, um, that some students, when they first walk into the, the OR, they think, everyone in there hates me. They don't like me, right? You, they might be right. I don't know. The reality is, is in the OR... X-ray techs are definitely the low man on the totem pole, and we've pretty much put ourselves there. Um, we can kind of own that, because we are, um, even if we were to do everything right, which we often don't, right, um, in terms of cleaning our own equipment and things like that, um, we are the number one least sterile thing in the operating room. The number one least sterile thing in the operating room. So everyone's going to be eyeing you with extreme prejudice because they're waiting for you to contaminate any one of their precious sterile fields, right? So be ready to bear, un bear up underneath that scrutiny, right? And my prayer will be that you will um, prove yourself worthy of the profession and soon be friends with all of those people because if you can show them that you've promoted a sterile consciousness, in fact, you'll kind of hear the room collectively sigh the first time that you point out to the charge nurse that she just contaminated a sterile field. Everyone will say, yes, this person has arrived. They are one of us now. So be aware of that. All right, skin prep. Um, you may or may not be involved in doing skin prep. And this means that now I'm going to make the patient's skin sterile, right? I'm going to remove all of the junk that's there on the patient's skin. So we use a skin prep set. It's, uh, it's kind of illustrated here on this uh, page uh, 336. That's a skin prep set. It's got the little stuff on it. We uh, generally have to ask a bunch of questions about allergies because some of the stuff that we use for skin prep can trigger an allergic response, and that would be a problem if we're trying to prep the area for surgery. Um, but we'll use some kind of antiseptic essentially for painting the skin. It will show you, there will be a color indication to it um, that the skin has been covered by this chemical. So people exit, you know, surgery. I always think about people exiting surgery looking a little bit like, like chickens with all their feathers ripped off of them, right? Because their skin turns that weird yellowish color and all the hair has been removed from the surface, right? So skin prep may include removing hair from the surface as well. Um, that's why we've got the razor. Um, 
So the first thing we'll do is we'll perform hand hygiene. Um, if necessary, we'll glove up, which generally it is necessary. Um, we'll get the patient in a secure, uh, a comfortable position and we'll talk to them about it. We'll try to maintain, if not their privacy, uh, well, their dignity, right? I used to tell this to patients all the time when I worked in radiation therapy because we spent a lot of time treating breasts and prostates and things like that. I would tell the patient straight up, I cannot always maintain your privacy or your modesty, but I'll do everything I can to maintain your dignity, right? And by that I mean I'm gonna cover you when I can and when I can't, I'm going to let you know, right? Um, so explain what you're, what you're doing, right? This kind of goes back to what we were looking at last week with the vital signs. Make sure you're articulating to the patient what's going on. Um, expose the area uh, larger than the pre prepared area. Um, keep the patient as comfortable as possible. Um, if you need to remove hair, do use a dry razor, right? Um, so uh, if you never practiced using a razor or whatever, I would practice it because um, you don't want to nick the skin or anything like that. That would be a problem, right? Um, but uh, practice using a razor. Um, then once you've got the hair removed, uh, use uh, sterile gauze um, and alcohol and remove all the uh, hair that might be sitting around because believe it or not, hair can contaminate things really easily, right? Um, I had to, I had this little Shih Tzu um, who we rescued at the library and when, she, when we got her she looked like a, a dirty mop. It looked like this mop had descended from outer space and was walking around or something. Um, she had all these hair mats and stuff all over her um, and so we had to clean up. That was the first thing we needed to do was clean up all the, the hair mats because it was actually producing infection in her body, right? Um, it was causing uh, sores on her skin and things like that. So I always think about her. Her name's Honeybun. Mm -hmm. um, so then we're gonna, now that we've got the hair out of the way, we're gonna perform the actual uh, hand hygiene and don sterile gloves, right? Um, and we'll waste a little bit of the antiseptic into a container, like into a trash can or into the sink. And the idea being that we are sterilizing the lip of the antiseptic bottle, right? So there's an illustration of this person pouring some of it down the drain for their homies, right? Um, and then uh, you fill up the medicine cup with antiseptic and this medicine cup that we're referring to is here on this sterile tray so this tray here is sterile right um, moving along so with our sterile gloves on we will uh, get some of those gauzes or sponges or this little doodad here that looks like a stick man with a flattened head can you see that little weird looking thing there? That's a Chlora Prep. And you just, you just compress the little arms together. It pops something inside the container and then it wets the sponge with the prep, with the, with the sterile chemical. And you literally paint the area. And you start in the center and you work your way out from the center. And I don't retouch the center, right? I'm basically just working from the center out in a big spiral we're not scrubbing or anything like that um, we allow the skin to dry if we need to we can repaint it with a separate thing we can grab a separate sponge or a separate chlora prep and do that process again of spiraling out from the end right with a new one um, and then we'll drape the area and we apply some kind of sterile drape to the patient's skin a lot of times it has like an adhesive or something on it that kind of sticks to the skin there right that is uh, prepping the patient for a, a sterile skin. All right, let's talk about surgical hand scrub. This says wear surgical attire, and what that means is whatever the hospital has or the medical facility has uh, said is appropriate attire to be worn in the hallways of the operating room. So uh, it, within surgery, within the operating room, if you will, there's these halls that connect to the various surgical theaters, the various operating rooms, right? Um, but just I'm just I'm stressing that because you will enter into the OR department, and at that point you should be wearing some of this proper proper surgical attire. You should be wearing something covering your hair, 
If you have a gigantic beard, you will literally have to put your gigantic beard in a like plastic bag thing. It's really fun. That's why I don't have a gigantic beard anymore. Um, you, uh, you'll probably need to wear some kind of foot covering. And, uh, and, and whatever the hospital has said in terms of the, the scrubs, the clothing that's worn in and out of the OR. And in general, the OR has the most comfortable scrubs. Because I don't know where they get them from, but it's super comfortable. So there's normally a changing room or something like that where you need to change into separate OR scrubs. Um, you will use a, to, to operate the sink, there's uh, foot or knee pedals. So you'll push down on the foot or knee pedals that will start the water flowing. And the, the spigot for the water, if you look here, it's kind of got this high arch to it, like that. And that's to help you do these maneuvers, right? Because similar to what I was saying about how we want to scrub from the inside and move out, we're working from our fingertips down. We want the crap off of our fingers is the purpose of this because we're using our fingers to help out. I'm not trying to perform surgery with my elbows is the idea. So wash the crap down towards the elbows and you're good to go. So that's why the sink is designed that way. And that's why we, uh, it doesn't have like hand controls on it. It's because we're trying to clean off our hands. So we're going to hold our hands like this and we're going to wash our hands like this. Um, you wet your hands, you use an antimicrobial soap, and there'll be these little um, bristles that you'll, you'll wash all around all of your little fingernails, right? Like this. You'll wash each of these little things up on top of your hands. I can't remember what those little folds are called. I'm sure they have a medical name, right? You're going to wash all of that with this little bristle. Um, you'll keep your fingernails trimmed short. Um, the, hospi the, book, the book mentions that there's a lot of controversy around whether you should wear shoe coverings or if it's okay to have your fingernails painted. I don't see any controversy. I would just say, wear the dang shoe coverings and don't paint your nails, right? If you're gonna work in the OR. Um, uh, and you should be good to go in terms of this uh, surgical prep. If, now, if you aren't having to scrub in regularly, like, so I worked in an OR for five years operating x-ray equipment with spine surgeons and stuff like that. I never once scrubbed in on a case. I would always just wheel my equipment in there, make sure the equipment was clean. And, I was, and like I said, I was the number one most contaminated thing in the room, right? So I lived in the operating theater, in the operating room, as the number one most contaminated thing. Because I, well, I wasn't doing any of the scrub. I did not need to scrub in. Why? Because the x-ray equipment was not sterile, right? And I was doing every, my job was to drive this equipment without running into any of the sterile fields, right? So, um, but we've got rules. And so as you're watching the surgeon, the reason I stress this is those people who are scrubbing in, something as simple as taking a phone call is impossible at this point, right? Um, looking to make sure you've got your wallet in your back pocket. Can't do that anymore, right? Um, did I remember to take my uh, kids' lunch to school? I don't know, because I'm scrubbed in. So uh, be aware that when that in, when the physician, when the doctor, or when the circulating nurse or the, uh, the the surgical techs enter the room, they'll have their hands like this, kind of held away from their body, um, like they're a mad scientist. And it, it's not really a good time to hit them up for like a, a, a great conversation about Area 51 and how everyone's going there in September, right? Like they, they're really focused on. I don't want anything to touch my hands right now. All right, I don't know that I'm gonna go into a whole lot more with this, but the, the big thing here is once I've scrubbed everything away to keep my hands above my elbows, because again, the water that's running down my arms now, I don't want it running towards my hand, I want it running away from my hands. All right. And you'll notice there's even rules for how you're going to dry your hands, right? Um, you'll use sterile ta uh, towels. Um, and then the very first thing you're going to do is to don a, a sterile uh, gown, right? So there'll be the packaging on the table. Your hands are basically considered fairly sterile. You'll kind of gently open this gown up and you'll basically walk around with your hands inside the gown sleeves until you have put gloves on. So there's an illustration of that. 
on here. So she was able to grab the gown and now she's walking around with her hands inside the arms on page uh, 342. You can also use a hand rub method. It's basically the same thing. You're just using a different junk to clean. It's, I don't know why they included additional stuff, but it is, it is the same process. All right, sterile gowning and gloving. You may be asked to wear a sterile gown or glove, um, gloves in particular, right? You may be asked to wear. Um, so the, uh, we've got the process here on page uh, 342. Someone's going to, uh, if you're, if you're bo doing a, both a gown and a glove, there will be someone ahead of you who opened up the package of the sterile gown and glove. And so you'll um, lift the uh, sterile gown out of the package and it, you'll be holding its back right at that point in time um, and you might be thinking well I just contaminated the outside of it yeah but it's the outside of the back right so um, again the, the point here being if I need to do anything while I'm wearing if I need to touch anything non sterile right um, while I'm wearing a sterile gown the back of the gown is the least sterile part right why because it's not facing the patient or anything like that or, you know, there's a risk that something could happen behind me. I wouldn't know it was there and contaminate it, right? So we just assume the back of the gown's not sterile, right? So we lift the back of it out, and we insert our arms into the sleeves, and we keep our arms, our arms down underneath it. The assistant or someone who's there behind you will, will fasten a little Velcro inside of it to hold it around your neck at that point. <clears throat> Now, if you've got a gown on, putting on the gloves is super easy, right? Because you can use the gown to grab the gloves, which is really helpful, right? So she's using the gown to grab the gloves and she's able to hold the, hold the gloves with the gown, right? Um, without contaminating the gloves. That's really helpful. It's helpful to be able to grab stuff like that. You can't, you can't do that normally if you're just gloving without a gown on. You'll start with your non-dominant hand. You'll stretch the uh, thing out over your hand and then uh, you'll pick up the second glove with just that sterile glove and you can work from there. It's pretty straightforward at that point. Uh, know your glove size. So try out the different glove sizes. They get really particular and know what kind of material you like. What, what kind of glove can, material you like. They'll ask you for like your, what flavor glove you like. They'll ask you that and you'll just say, I like a seven whatever, you know, seven and a half this. Um, know what works best for you. All right, once you've got your gloves on, your hands are sterile, and you've got this little thing attached to the waist of your gown that is a sterile tab, you'll pull that off and you hand it to the assistant, and they'll hold that out by the paper piece, and you do this little turnaround thing, and that wraps the gown around you, and then you can grab the strap, not the paper piece, because the paper piece has been contaminated, and you can tie the gown up, right? Then your, your gowning is complete. Now, one, there's a couple of critical thinking things here that I want you to understand. If a person is going to wear a lead apron, they will need to have put it on before they wash their hands, before they put on those gloves, and before they put on that gown, right? So one of the jobs that we have as x-ray techs is to have the x-ray equipment in the room prior to starting the, the surgery, right? And to know what the doctor's preferences are for shielding. Because it, as you can imagine, even though the OR room is really cold a lot of times, if I'm wearing a lead apron, plus all the surgical attire, plus a gown, plus gloves, and I'm standing over a patient's body and I start to get hot, that's not a good thing. You know what I mean? 
Like if I'm having to operate a scope or I've got a splash shield on my face and I start to sweat and I fog up the splash shield, that's a problem, right? So what I'm saying for us, the critical thinking part for us is to communicate with your physicians, understand from them or from the charge nurse, talk it up with them. What kind of shielding do you want in here? Do you want me to roll in a portable shield? I had one doctor, he just literally wanted a kilt, right? Um, it was this uh, surgical skirt that you, it was a shielded skirt that he could wear. And that's what he wore into, the, into his cases. He didn't care about anything up here. He just, he was willing to let this stuff get irradiated by scatter or whatever, just save the family jewels, and he was good. Um, I think he, he started talking more, and uh, one day I walked into the OR, and I think he literally wore this. So he asked for, I, I gave him a thyroid shield and I gave him a pediatric um, crotch shield that we called the fig leaf, right? So he was just wearing this little tiny fig leaf over his package the entire surgery. He thought it was hilarious. Um, so, but know what their preferences are. His preference was he didn't want to overheat in the shielding. He still wanted to wear enough shielding to protect his gonads, but he did not want to wear more than that, right? Um, other physicians, they do not want to wear any lead apron at all. Like if they're going to be standing in the room for a long time and they know the x-ray is only going to be there for a little bit, screw the lead apron. I just want to step away. So they want a pathway. They want the distance method. Just let me know before you do the x-rays. I'm going to step six to eight feet away. So I want this pathway clear so that I can step away and not have to worry about being contaminated while I step away. Right? Um, other physicians, they want some kind of portable shielding. So it's like a wall on wheels, and it's a heavy lead wall. You can wheel it around, and so you'd want it to be somewhere on their side of the table, um, but away from their instruments to where they can step around their instruments, get behind the wall, you can do your x-ray, and they can look at the pictures. So it requires some communication, some critical thought, and for you to be a, a, an active member of the team and designing the room for radiation safety while at the same time maintaining a sterile environment. So understanding these gloving techniques and these gowning techniques are largely there for you to appreciate the significance of the sterile field and to develop some fine motor skills related to gloving, right? That's, that's my main focus here. So you understand what these sterile fields are, where they're located, and so that you can be thinking uh, in a year or so from now uh, about the operation of the C-arm in, in the presence of that, right? So what I'm, what I'm picturing is that a year or so from now, when you have your first surgical rotation, you go back over this chapter. You review yourself, you, you remind yourself of these processes, right? Um, prior to working in the operating room. All right, but this will be a helpful thing to know. The open glove will be a helpful thing to know. And some of us might even be asked to do this our very first day of clinic, some of us. So you'll perform hair, hand hygiene and uh, you'll find uh, the gloves that you like that are the right size. Uh, you open that outer wrap, and you bear in mind your hands are not, can, your hands are not sterile. Like you washed your hands, but they are not sterile, right? So you open that outer wrap, and then you fold the gloves open like this. Now the inside of this paper piece here, and we'll get to look at this here in just a minute, is sterile. The part where the gloves are living right now is sterile. So I've made a little tiny sterile field here, right? I did not reach across the sterile field or anything like, like that. I just opened it outward, right? Um, and then I'm going to pick up one of the gloves using just the inside of the glove. The gloves are made like a, I don't know, some people fold their socks together in the sock drawer. It's like the inside of the sock, right, is the part that you can grab. So you grab that inside piece and you can pick it up and use that, it's very difficult, to slide it over your hand, right? If any part of your hand touches the outside of the glove, you have to start the whole process over again. It's a big pain in the butt. Um, so this is one of the reasons why people don't wear rings, right? They don't wear watches, things like that, um, because this stuff can just get in the way of the process. Um, so you put the first glove on, touching only the inner surface of that folded cuff. And then now that I've got a hand that's, at least my hand is good right? Like the folded cuff is still folded back. I can actually grab 
the next glove underneath the cuff and use that to slide my other hand on, right? And now that I've got this hand good and I've pulled this taunt, I can pull this side, I can pull the cuff down on this side. Now I have two sterile uh, gloved hands. All right, wound dressing. You may occasionally be asked to help with um, cleaning up a wound area, something that's already been um, uh, dressed and taken care of, but the dressing has become soiled. So the first thing you want to do is perform hand uh, hygiene and don some gloves, right? Um, and the initial pair of gloves that you can wear, I don't think need to be sterile gloves because this thing's contaminated. Um, so you inform the patient, you let them know what you're going to do, you remove that dressing, um, making sure you're not going to cross-contaminate yourself. So you're going to treat the dressing and your gloves as all contaminated, right? No part of it should be touching you. Um, you don't want to hurt the patient, but then you will dispose of all of that in a biohazard container, right? Um, once you've done that, you're going to remove the gloves as well and dispose of them, right? Then you perform hand hy hygiene again. So I've got this uncovered area. And prior to this next step, we should have prepared these, slide, these uh, supplies. But I've got my sterile gloves now, sterile drape, sterile gauze, tape, and some kind of normal saline. Um, so I've, again, performed my hand hygiene. This was not a surgical scrub, just hand hygiene. Um, I'll have some tape torn out to like post it along the side of an edge so I've got it there and it's convenient. I'll open up that drape package. I'll put on um, my sterile gloves, right? Um, and then we're going to clean the area as need be, right? Um, <clears throat> And once it's dry, you just reapply the same, the same bandage style. So you'll have the exact same bandage that you removed, you'll just reapply that. So all we're doing is just removing the soiled material, um, cleaning off any gunk that might be in the area that's, would be, that would mess with the application of the bandage itself, um, and then just reapply the, uh, the uh, bandage, and then you just uh, dispose of all the supplies that you used and wash your hands again. right? Well, that's all I've got for is in terms of a lecture.